Porsche Chevrolet Corvette. One of America's defining sports cars experienced a boom in sales in the early 1980s. It also became one of the most popular cars for thieves to steal. Insurance companies charged owners of the car up to 40% more just because of the theft rates. Could a team of mechanics, engineers, and locksmiths put a stop to the likes of organized car theft rings? Or would the bad guys stay one step ahead? I'm Tim Coleman. I'm Tyler J. Thomas. And I'm Jeff Moss. Together, we will explore and discuss these events from the perspective of over 30 years of combined locksmith and door hardware experience. This is The Three Tumblers. Now, Grand Theft Corvette. After driving down the East Coast from Massachusetts, 20-year-old Christopher Fletcher and his kid brother went out for a walk on Miami Beach in July of 1981. Unfortunately for Gary Kay, they weren't out on a walk of fun. The brothers had scoped out the 36-year-old from Jackson, Mississippi after he got out of his car. Chris pulled a revolver on Gary, aimed it at his chest, and said, give me the keys to your car. Kay, obviously afraid for his life, didn't argue when the brothers told him they wanted his vet. Minutes later, Gary called police to report his 1977 Chevy Corvette had just been stolen from him at gunpoint. Miami Beach police officer J.J. Dowd was patrolling along the Julia Tuttle Causeway when he heard the theft at the 73rd Street Beach access go out. Within minutes, the black Corvette passed him at nearly 100 miles an hour, and Officer Dowd was in hot pursuit. A few miles up the road, Dowd had help from nine Miami Beach police cars, as well as others from Miami Metro and Hialeah PD. Fifteen minutes after the chase began, Christopher crashed into a roadblock set up at 651 East 25th Street outside the Hialeah Hospital, damaging two Metro cars and a Miami Beach patrol car. The brothers were taken into custody and charged with armed robbery, possession of a stolen vehicle, willfully fleeing police officers, and that was just for starters. This is only the beginning of the Corvette theft trend of the early 80s. Saturday, January 17, 1953, at the Waldorf Astoria Hotel in New York City, the Corvette prototype was revealed to the world. Post-war America was starting to boom with interest in cars for guys and gals alike, and they had a particular interest in sporty cars. By 1968, the Corvette got a facelift, and now had its iconic flared fenders and mid-engine configuration. Engines were available up to the 454 cubic inch, or 7.4 liter size V8, coupled with a four-speed manual transmission. By 1980, the standard powerhouse of a VET was the L82 350 5.7 liter V8 engine, giving it a 1 to 3 power to weight ratio. The fourth generation of Corvette, known as the C4, rolled off the Bowling Green Kentucky production lines in 1983. With a completely new chassis, new engine options, and computer-controlled automatic transmissions all advertised in television commercials, the car was an instant hit. What General Motors didn't advertise, however, was how big of a hit the car was with thieves. This is certainly an interesting time in America's history for all intents and purposes crime, nonviolent and violent, peaked in the late 1980s, early 1990s in America, which I guess is a great thing. To paint some perspective, in 1977, the U.S. population is around 216 million, and there were just over 3 million reported burglaries and 5.9 million reported thefts. 
in 2013, we were at 316 million people in this country, and the burglaries were at 1.9 million, and thefts were at 6 million. So you increase the population by 100 million, reported burglaries are still down over a million, thefts have only increased by 100,000. So I wish we could get into the reasons why, but suffice to say, as we make our way through the 60s, 70s, 80s, the crime in America is starting to make its grand ascent. And here come these beautiful cars that everybody wants. Yeah, and you know I can remember hearing stories where people didn't lock their cars, and then in the 80s and 90s, people had kill switches, and aftermarket car alarms were very, very popular. My grandparents had them vehicles, you know, before they came with them uh, as a factory item. You know, that was almost like a cottage industry of automotive electronics places um, because cars didn't really come with that stuff, even remote control you know remotes which are ubiquitous now back in the 80s and 90s that was a big deal and i just gotta say the corvette is just the classic quintessential american sports car i mean it's two-seater it has these really really nice curves and it has a huge engine this thing will stand up and walk compared to any competition on the market at the time and it's made domestically so people are really really wanting this car white plains new york february 1980 fabrizi vito went to curry chevrolet on central park avenue a little after 11 a.m posing as a young but potential buyer interested in a 1979 baby blue corvette when the salesman left the 15-year-old alone for just a few minutes, Fabrizi hopped in the vet and sped away. The theft was reported by the dealership quickly, and about 20 minutes later, an Ardsley police officer radioed that a young man driving a light blue Corvette had just stolen $20 of gas, just over 15 gallons at the time, from the Sawmill River Road station. Patrolman Robert Sorrentino saw the car driving west on Route 119 towards Terrytown at 80 to 90 miles per hour. The boy sideswiped several cars, spun around, and jumped the curb speeding back east. At Route 119 and Benedict Boulevard, another officer had set up a roadblock and Fabrizi swerved to miss him, smashing into a tree. After a brief fight with police, cutting an officer with a knife in the process. The teenager was in custody. The baby blue 1977 vet with a 350 engine, automatic transmission, and 11,000 miles on the odometer was taken to the scrapyard. While Fabrizi posed as a potential buyer and drove the car off after the salesman cranked the engine, other vet thieves had to put a little more effort into things, but not by much. In 1983, Chevrolet released the fourth generation Corvette, the C4, with a radical redesign that was synonymous with 1980s styling. The C4 was an instant hit, selling over 51,500 cars in its first model year. General Motors cars in the late 70s and early 80s had ignition switches that could either be forced over, breaking the thin brass pieces known as wafer tumblers, or the entire locking switch mechanism could be removed in a matter of minutes. Whichever way the thieves chose, it was a successful business. So for some obvious reasons, we're not going to go into details on this podcast about how to actually steal one of these cars. That would be remiss of us. And if you tuned in trying to find that information out, well, sorry, you're just going to have to enjoy the story as we tell it. Yeah, and I won't go into specifics, but suffice to say, it was incredibly easy to steal a car at this time. If you have a desk or a cabinet at your home or office and it has a standard lock in it, a car's lock is only slightly more secure than it at this point in time. Yeah, and uh, over time, they made it more difficult. Uh, they put hardened inserts in so that it was a lot more difficult to use a puller 
to get the ignition out. Uh, later on, they switched to a, what's called the bolt-in ignition, which uh, actually is a torch screw, and you have to take the whole steering wheel off to get the ignition out. And uh, thank you to one of my coworkers who was a locksmith in those days. They did tons of them. Most guys had it down to a, to a sign as far as swapping out ignitions pretty quickly. As the criminals figured out how to get into them, the uh, manufacturers, you know, whether it was GM or Briggs and Stratton at the time, uh, definitely made this stuff more difficult for the thieves and a little bit more time consuming on the locksmith end as well. Undercover FBI agents and state police officers have been working their way into various organized crime outfits. Using their underworld connections, they trace a large number of stolen cars that are being smuggled whole or in pieces to Mexico and beyond. As early as 1980, agents had arrested two clergymen as being part of a national crime syndicate responsible for jacking over 150 cars across the country. In Michigan, 37 people were rounded up for taking part in a massive car theft ring, including business owners and elected officials. By 1985, car theft was a major source of income for the Mafia. Most stolen vets wound up in so-called chop shops, where criminals would disassemble the car down to its bare bones and sell off every individual component, with the exception of the key ignition, of course. Many of these parts were then shipped to foreign countries, where they were sold for a good profit or traded for drugs. Police in Mexico bragged to the press that they were immune from arrest due to their connections between the cartels, mafia, and elected officials. Some blame the rise in car thefts due to an internal change of policy in the FBI. J. Edgar Hoover had been hard-hitting when it came to bank robberies and car thefts. However, William Webster wants to focus more on white-collar crimes. No matter the cause, the effect was hitting consumers. Insurance companies were now charging owners up to 40% more in premiums just for having a vet. One man even had his 79 Stingray stolen only days after his policy had lapsed. Yeah, I mean, like we said before, this was a big thing back in the in the 80s and 90s. I was a kid, so I don't remember hearing about car thefts, but I know people were, you know, very cautious about locking their vehicles all the time um, where they didn't do that before. You know, mostly they're even today, they're crimes of opportunity, but having a fancy, flashy car is going to draw attention to uh, what you have. And for the same reason that people who drive red sports cars get pulled over a lot, those nice cars get taken because people know that they're worth a lot of money and that they're, you know, all the parts and all that stuff is very valuable. I can certainly remember hearing about chop shops when I was a kid, never seeing one, but I'm sure they exist and existed then and exist today. Like I said earlier, they were incredibly easy to steal. And now a national law enforcement agency has apparently different priorities. And local law enforcement agencies are already overworked, overstressed, overtasked. And this perfect opportunity presents itself to thieves and crime syndicates. Right. Like you just said, the FBI has gone through five different directors since Hoover's death in 1972. And when he died, Congress and the government changed the process for the confirmation of the FBI director. So now you had Congress and the president all working together to decide who was in charge of the National Law Enforcement Agency, the Federal Bureau of Investigation. So politics probably had some sort of play in that decision. This wasn't a brand new thing then, and it's still going on today. April Fool's Day, 1984, Dalton, Georgia. Eddie Beal, Douglas Cochran, and Jackie Baines made headlines in the Atlanta Constitution 
after they were found guilty for their roles in a Corvette theft reign where more than 30 cars were stolen. In December of that same year, police in Twin Falls, Idaho were investigating the theft of a 1985-year model vet taken right out of a dealership. The bright red car, valued at $30,500, was literally driven right out of the showroom. Stolen vets were even romanticized in the movie Corvette Summer, starring Mark Hamill and Annie Potts. The car is now America's most stolen vehicle. Even with a reliable vehicle identification number, or VIN, system, it only made it easier to track how many cars had been boosted. According to the National Insurance Crime Bureau, the Corvette made up 61% of car thefts nationwide, the most common years being 1984, 1981, 1979, 1985, in 1980 in that order. The boys at General Motors had a real dilemma on their hands in 1984. Their most popular sports car, and one of the most profitable, was also one of the most sought-after targets by thieves, mostly because of how easy it was to steal. They had to come up with a way to protect their luxury sports car and its buyers. But Chevrolet was still essentially using the same technology developed by Steve Briggs and Harold Stratton back in the 1940s, and car thieves had long since known various bypasses and defeats for ignition locks. GM started pulling out the stops to try to keep their pride and joy in the competitive market. So they brought in teams of researchers, engineers, electronics specialists, and probably a few locksmiths to tackle the problem. Their mission was simple, make a locking system that makes the vet harder to steal. We continue to you know, see these problems even today with you know, some of the, now it's actually the cheaper vehicles being more commonly stolen because they're easy to get into. Um, I think back then, you know, these cars were just a target because they were the, you know, the newest thing on the block and you know sought after probably very and very expensive you know kudos to the manufacturers of that time for trying to make things better and staying ahead of the bad guys but nowadays with the internet a lot easier to uh, have those things released you know you probably had to go into the back of some magazines to get uh, tools or you know surreptitious information you know now you know they're out there doing TikTok videos of starting a car with a USB cord. And a neat history fact here, and the reason why we have VINs on all of our cars is because of a federal law that passed in 1954. Manufacturers were using their own forms of VINs on vehicles prior to that, but after that law passed, it became mandatory. And the purpose was twofold. Number one, to discourage thefts, and then number two, to track vehicle thefts after they had been stolen. And in 1981, National Highway Traffic Safety Administration, NHTSA, formalized the rules for VINs that we now take for granted. You know, the 17-digit alphanumeric code that we all see and have to tell our insurance companies about when we buy a new car. The chop shops we just heard about really mess things up uh, nearly always because manufacturers only put the VIN in one area and it was riveted with a badge uh, but you could easily remove them or replace them or fabricate new ones. In response to that, manufacturers started stamping VIN numbers all over the car in various components, and they didn't tell anybody about it. You know, it was an inside trade secret. Uh, to paint this into a broader picture, uh, the Oklahoma City bombing in 1995, they were able to identify the truck used in the bombing uh, due to a partial VIN that was recovered on a rear axle from Timothy McVeigh's rider truck. When it exploded, it shot it out somewhere. They were able to find it, recover it, and identify a partial VIN off of that. So kind of like much like stolen guns, areas with the VIN numbers that have been grinded or otherwise noticeably tampered with set off red flags with law enforcement. So we're starting to see manufacturers fight back in more ways than one at this point. 
Let's also not forget that General Motors was losing money at this time. People are starting to reconsider buying the Corvette. I mean, you think about it. In 1985, when that Corvette was stolen from that dealership in Twin Falls, Idaho, the price then was $30,500. In 2024 money, that is $87,423.03. That's a lot of money, even today, even more so today, perhaps. In late 1985, GM made the announcement to the public that, after months of research and development, they have a new way to combat thefts of people's precious Corvettes. It uses a mechanical key, much like what is used in all other GM cars, but this one is a little different. Just a fingertip away from the head, or bow of the key, as it's called, is a black oblong bump that juts out from both sides. This bump contains an electrical resistor that is one of 15 different values. A resistor is simply a small piece of material that limits the flow of electricity through a circuit. Think of it as your least favorite traffic bottleneck you drive through. Everything is moving fine, and then for no good reason, everyone slows down, in the exact same spot, every day, without fail. Resistors do the same thing for electricity, but to a very specific degree. So specific, in fact, it can be reliably replicated and mass-produced. Every single item or device you use today has some form of resistor inside of it. The researchers at GM decided to use the good old resistor, along with a simple computer that could tell exactly how much electricity was held back by it. If that electrical value matched what the car's computer said it needed to, and the ignition was turned, the car would start right up. If it didn't, though, the car didn't crank, and nothing would work for up to five minutes. Hot wiring a car was out of the question as well. The starter motor and its wiring were so interconnected with this system that it couldn't easily be isolated. Thieves fear two things noise, and time. Anything that attracts attention to a criminal increased the chances of getting caught. Getting caught meant going to jail, sometimes worse on who the thief was working for. Starting with the 1986 year model, all new Corvettes were equipped with a vehicle anti-theft system. That's, as it was referred to, was instantly a hit. The new vets were quickly considered untouchable by thieves, since any bypass of the key meant carrying more tools and needing over 20 minutes on average to drive away in someone else's car. I've seen this time and time again in my career in law enforcement. The more time that a criminal has to spend on the scene of a crime, the less likely they are to escape without being identified. If you can get in and get out very quickly, then you stand a better chance of evading capture, at least for a little while. You'll always leave some evidence behind, and most every criminal does get caught. But to sit in a car for 20 minutes trying to steal it is just unthinkable by most criminals these days. So back then, 30, almost 40 years ago, that was a very long time to have to spend more than five minutes in a car and get away clean. Yeah, this five minute delay is the predecessor of what we now call lockout timers. And it's a brilliant feature of VATS because it prevents someone from brute forcing the lock. And when I say brute forcing, I mean, they're basically trying all the codes and possibilities in a short period of time. In the early days of hacking, we used to use word lists, which basically tried to do the same thing. We'd run through a lot of common passwords really quick until you got to the right one. So how did the manufacturers respond to that? Well, that's the reason why you get three or five chances before you're locked out of your account right now. So you don't get free range to try everything as often as possible, thereby negating VAT's purpose. No, you have to wait, which again, 
back in the 80s. This is brilliant security engineering and stuff that we still use today. Yeah, I mean, it would take at least a half hour, I think, to interrogate FATS because you got 15 keys, 15 different resistor values to try. It's a pain. You know, I've heard the, I've heard plenty of horror stories of, you know, going through all the keys, having to have another ignition, and fishing the wires, and all this kind of stuff. Not that the newer stuff doesn't have its own problems, but back then, you know, the harder, not to get off on a tangent, but people who want, you know, a high security lock on their front door and all this stuff, yeah, you're making it harder for a criminal to get in, but you're also making it a lot harder uh, on yourself when there's a lockout situation or something fails. Um, so with all these anti-theft measures, you see it today, um, Chrysler's and other things with the security gateway and, and stuff that they're doing, you know, that makes it a lot harder for the locksmith to make an additional key uh, because of the security measures that are designed to keep the crooks out, whether by design or not, makes our job harder. In the dark parking lot, a young man walked towards his target, a sleek black 1986 Corvette. With a low profile and curves, he could see why it inspired the Batmobile in the new movie that just came out. Since the owner of the car had the T-tops in, the man stuck a lockout tool down the window into the door. With a quick motion, the door was open and he slid inside. He took out a screwdriver and did just what his cousin had showed him years ago, and the ignition turned to the start position. Nothing happened. No click of a dead battery. No thunk of a starter gear being engaged. Not even the radio came on. Except, there was a small light on the dashboard he hadn't seen before. He tried pulling the ignition out, even though he knew about the special screw designed to hold it in, and went to the wires. Still, nothing happened. He was confused and starting to get nervous. His uncle would be furious if he came back empty-handed. Suddenly, a teenager working as a valet saw him sitting in the car. He jumped and ran, but got caught just a few blocks away. Threatened by both sides before the trial, he never snitched. Other members of the Gambino crime family weren't so lucky, though. Some got off with light sentences, others who had blood on their hands got life, and some got taken out by their own family members. The same scene was playing out in L.A., Chicago, and Miami. Thieves would try to steal a new Corvette using the old techniques, but with no avail. Vats was now enemy number one of car thieves. Now we're starting to see the thieves run scared. They really don't like this VAT system. Because of what we just discussed with that time lockout, it puts them literally in the car at the scene of the crime for longer than it ever has before. Nothing has ever physically stopped them other than their ability to steal the car. Now, there is an outside force acting on that, and they don't like it. So, the most valuable stolen commodity that they can put their hands on in society is untouchable. This new year model, it's off limits. You can't do it. And, not to mention, Law enforcement is closing in. Like we said, they are undercover. They're arresting clergymen. They're arresting people off the street. They are getting to the bigger fish every day. And as we round this out, VATs and future variants of the same principle, what we now call immobilizers, they've been incredibly effective for decades. They're relatively commonplace these days and why car theft has continued to drop until recently. And I say recently because people and manufacturers, by and large, have taken things for granted and are doing stupid things like leaving their keys inside of their car or selling brand new, decently priced cars without the mobilizer technologies, basically what we're discussing here with VATS. 
when you utilize something like vats, immobilizers, whatever you want to call it, whatever the manufacturer calls it, they're incredibly effective. You know, gone are the days of the Slim Jim. You know, vehicle alarms, you do anything, the alarm's going to go off, and then you won't be able to start the car. Um, so the technology's getting better and better. Although I do have to wonder about people who keep the key in their purse or their pocket all the time and you, know, you walk up to the car and unlock it, things like that. Or your phone is your key now. You know, there's obviously not a perfect situation. And I think the bad guys are still trying to stay one step ahead when they can. By the late 80s, VATS, or passkey as it was now known, was a proven theft deterrent. General Motors soon introduced it on other makes and models, including the Firebird, Camaro, and Eldorado. By the mid-90s, it was included on most any General Motors car. Insurance companies now offer discounts instead of increases for having Corvettes and other vehicles with VATS. The Stingray that the Beach Boys told about shutting down a Dodge was nearly shut down in its fourth incarnation by thieves. But it turned around when engineers and lock experts hit high gear. Arguably the most iconic American sports car ever made, its anti-theft system was ahead of its time. But the boys in Detroit didn't stop there. They kept developing their anti-theft system and it got other manufacturers, including European ones, to start offering their own electronic anti-theft systems. Some going as far as requiring EEPROM reprogramming just to make a copy of a simple key. General Motors produced the first vehicle security innovation since the key, and it continues to improve every year. Engineers, specialists, and locksmiths will continue to combat vehicle theft but their systems are not always foolproof. Executive producer is Tyler J. Thomas. Technical producer is Jeff Moss. Writer and editor is Tim Coleman. For source materials, see our website, 3tumblers.com. Get this episode and others wherever you get your podcasts. This has been a Three Tumblers production, copyright 2024, all rights reserved.